Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, James. Um, and I'm delighted you've given that introduction because that means I don't have to talk about myself because I hate talking about myself. So that's, that's that done. Um, right, first of all, so just to give me a little flavor for what you're all doing, how many of you are in the economics faculty or doing something with the economics faculty here? So what, so it's just under half the room? And how many, so what, what else, do, what, what brings the other people here to an economics uh, kind of thing, themed talk? What other departments are you in? So I'm doing urban planning, but I read about you and it said that you're an entrepreneur also and you would talk about business and transformation and things like that, so I just wanted to come and listen. Oh, that's very kind of you. I don't think we're going to get much time for the entrepreneurial uh, stuff, but sure. we, yeah. And anyone else just to get a bit of flavour for where you're from? Big what fan you of Mises. Oh, right. So I've come along and hear about Mises and the Austrian school more generally. Oh, great. Okay. Lovely. You, you, you two guys at the back there. You... Oh, I'm just a, a hater of big governments. Oh. <laughs> so it's, so it's <laughs> that positive school thinking. So yes. Yes. Okay. Well, interesting. Well, look, so. Uh, in, in my uh, incorrect location there, when we were sitting down quite happily having a chat with two of your economics colleagues there, Sinar and Brendan, um, they are, do you mind me saying this, you're from the uh, Stanford, Stanford yeah. faculty and basically you're doing a very highly um, quantitative, quantitative economics course um, and you were thinking, you don't really know the sort of antecedents of the, of the history of thought of the on the economic side and where things have all come from. Is that fair, fair enough? Yeah. yeah, summary of what we're saying, yeah. And that you're given things like utility, utility function and you're just given it and then off you, off you go and you don't really know where it's all come from, yeah? Well, that is the subject of praxeology, is the first thing we're actually gonna talk about, the epistemological foundations of, uh, of the very thought process of, of how, you, how, how, how um, this has all come about. But I'll just digress a little bit before. So, as I was explaining to you two guys earlier, if I, if, I go back, if I was to go back to my old university, LSE, and to say, you know, I'm Toby Baxendale, I've, I've done this before, and you, I'm really interested in promoting aspects of Austrian school teaching, the professors will be very lovely towards you, and they'll say, this is wonderful, we love the Austrian school, but all, the, all, all of uh, what's good of the Austrian school has already been embedded into the uh, economics um, program anyway um, and the rest of it um, well you know it's not very useful um, so the rest of it is the not very useful bit it is a bit that I think is very useful that I'm going to talk about today it's the bit that's been rejected really or not not yeah well rejected wholesale in some cir circumstances and only partially absorbed in other senses and the stuff that's been absorbed is all uh, to do with the subjective theory of value um, that's all taken as that's all take that came from the Austrian school. It came from Karl Menger, um, from um, von von Berwerk, and from um, Mises and, peop and people like that. And it's largely just been absorbed into in, in, into the main body of economics. Um, and that's a fact, and that is true. Um, but all this kind of stuff has been primarily rejected or marginalised. Um, but this is where I think you've got the really interesting stuff. So. Praxeology, has anyone ever heard that before? What it means? Well, you're a Mises fan, so I mean, you, yeah, <laughs> you have. Would you like to give a little explanation of it or, or shall I, no? Anyone? <laughs> so it's the study of human action from praxis and ology, the study of action, human action. And it's Mises' unique insight. Ludwig von Mises was a, was a, um, late 1800s to about 19, end of the 1960s, early, early 70s, an economist. Um, he's called Austrian school, uh, although he was born in Lviv, which is now Ukraine, which was then Poland. Um, and he's a Jewish guy. And, um, you know, if you read his biography, um, I think he was one of the first ones in his family who, believe it or not, were allowed to live in, site, in the center of Vienna. Uh, because Jews were kept beyond the walls. So horrific were they, you know, at the, t at the time. Uh, but he was one of the first families and he, he became a teacher at the University of, uh, of Vienna, a professor there. Although, still in those days, 
he wasn't a salaried teacher, he, was, he had to be privately funded because of his ethnic, ethnicity. Um, so he's an outcast from the, from the start. Um, but anyway, he, he, started, he started thinking about um, you know, the foundations of, the, uh, uh, of economics and his simple, um, his simple insight was that humans act, they act purposefully, okay, which is an axiom. So is everyone, is everyone familiar with an axiom? You're all familiar with an axiom. So you act, you act purposefully and it, you, know, you, it's, it's, um, you can't refute it because even if you say, right, I'm gonna act unpurposefully, you're acting purposefully. So it's, a, it's impossible to uh, refute it. It's, a, it's as good as two plus two equals four. You know? It's impossible to ever make that incorrect. Yeah? Um, and in, but therefore, anything you deduce from it can only be true. So what can you deduce from it? And this is, comes to your point of where does utility all emerge from, you know, has it just come out of uh, nowhere like a piece of magic? No, it's come out of a thought, thought process such as humans act, they act purposely. They rank, and we all do, our most urgent or our most needed or our most wanted uh, desires first, and they're the things you do right now instantaneously, and then you have, you know, a slow gradation down of preferences you know, all the way down to, to next to nothing, which sets the foundation for the downward sloping demand curve. Um, and that's, that's why um, we have the downward sloping demand curve and then all the things that follow from that in economics that you can then start deducing from. And as you've seen, we've never mentioned at any point in time any empirical element to this. It's all a thought process. It's all subjective and it's all in the mind and it's all a thought process. Yeah, but from that, from that thought, you, you can then start to deduce, and Mises does it in Human Action, the whole body of knowledge of, of economics, of what he deemed to be of e economics at that point in time. Um, you know, the law of diminishing marginal utility. Um, you know, and you get into the macro stuff like interest rate, how, how um, you know, the subjective your subjective preferences and those downward sloping demand curves determine interest rates through time preference because you always value um, present things more than you value, value future things. So the whole, the wonderful thing about Mises uh, is the whole, he spins out from his mind, from this one axiom, the entirety of the laws of economics, um, which is extraordinary um, if, if, if you think about it. And I think it's because it's so extraordinary that people find it, you know, possibly unbelievable. Now he was a Kantian, um, so Immanuel Kant, as everyone, when you were there, he's a, he's a Kantian. So he, he viewed economics to just be a, a category of the mind. Um, and that um, and you, and from there, as I said, you can spin out all these, uh, all, these, um, all these truths. But interestingly, he thought economics was um, a rare category of thought in terms of it was a, a, a synthetic a priori. A priori. So is, it, are, is everyone familiar with a, what an a priori is and a synthetic and, a, and an analytical? Yeah, yeah. So, so an analytical uh, uh, a priori is a ma something like a mathematical proposition. So you can spin it out of your head, yeah? Uh, you don't need to, I don't need to sit there and in that two plus two equals four analogy, get my twos and my twosomes and put them together and look at them and, 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 and add them up together and keep on adding them all the time to get myself comfortable that they, that they are a truth. Yeah. I know, I know it's a tautological tr truth, isn't it? Uh, straight, straight away, instinctively. So that's one way of gaining knowledge. The other, the other way of gaining is, um, via exper ex experience, exper um, via a, posti a, a posteriori way of, uh, uh, way of thinking, which is that, that empirical approach, that the, the, sci the scientific approach, um, whereby you're going for, um, uh, looking for um, correlations and empirical um, observations that deduce that by. Now, um, and that's fine, and, and that's wonderful for the sciences, and it works extremely well for, for the sciences. Now, Modern economics would like to think it's a science, yeah. Uh, in terms of in, in terms of following that empirical in, in, that empirical process, yeah. 
Whereas Mises will say, well, hey, hold on a minute. It is a science in terms of it's an orderly, bo orderly body of knowledge, uh, which is as the Greeks understood science. We, understood, we understand science now as moderns and to be very siloed into certain specific things. But uh, the Greeks would understand history to be a science because it's an orderly body of knowledge presented as such. Now, Mises would say, well, actually, it's a synthetic a priori because it's, it's, um, it's, tautolo it's, a, it's taut a tautological um, and, ev and you can everything you deduce from it is going to be correct. Um, but it actually has great um, resonance on reality. Yeah. So another, another example is <coughs> something like Euclid's, Euclid's geometry, yeah? which again, you can spin out of your head through a series of, of deductions. You don't, you don't need to you know, go and um, you know, build a, uh, a little engineering contraption and keep on testing it and testing it and testing it. If you know Euclidean's laws of geometry, you know it's going to work. You either know it's going to work, or you, if it doesn't, you've done your calculations wrong. Yeah, so that's something. That, that's something where you've got a, um, a, a an, an a priori thought that has that isn't just like a mathematical proposition, which is abstract. Yeah, um, it has real bearance on reality. It is reality. Yeah, so it's a, one of those very rare um, rare subject matters, economics that. Uh, you, uh, crosses over both um, both sort of ways of gaining knowledge. So an another example to help illustrate that, as I said, I, I said it's the hardest part. By the way, this is so if people are falling asleep. You know, <laughs> I can understand, yeah. But it, it is the most to me. It's the most interesting part because it's the part that really distinguishes this school from everybody else in the economic sphere. Because its start point is the is exactly this. Um, and it's the bit that's rejected, yeah? So, um, I can't remember where I was going with that, but I'll just do a little digression. So Lionel Robbins, uh, who was the economics, head of economics, and then he became the dean, if you like, of London School of Economics um, after the Second World War, but before, before the Second World War, he was there as a, as a teacher. He wrote The Economic Foundations of Science, which was inspired by this way of thinking. And his, the first edition, is all following this way of thinking. And it, and, it, and it was the great, that LSE then was the great rival against Cambridge, which rejected that way of, which re rejected that way of thinking. That was the way of, and that became the way of Keynes over there in Cambridge. And the way of LSE was the way of this way of thinking. But by the time he did his second edition, he kind of moved away from these, he kind of, you know, just left it alone and uh, didn't discuss the, found, uh, the epistemological <coughs> foundations of, uh, of how you acquire ec economic knowledge. Um, and it's been left that way in the UK largely ever since. Um, but that, to me, is the, um, is the most interesting part, really, and it's the hardest part of understanding. Because you need to have a bit of a, f a philosophical mind. You need to have a little bit of a philosophical bent to get yourself uh, into understanding where they're coming from. But I'll give you another practical example of a synthetic a priori. If, um, if, you're, um, if you know the laws of, you know how Newton, Newton can, if you know the Newtonian laws, you can map out the, gal uh, the stars and you can work out the movements of all the planets and you can predict them, yeah? So now we know that, yeah? We know, we know those Newt Newtonian laws. <coughs> we can predict, you know, when a, uh, you know, a, a a sunset is coming, when a um, solar eclipse is coming, um, when, you know, Venus is going to be in the sky and where it's going to be and, and, and so on and so forth. We don't actually need to do any empirical work on that because we now just know that. So although that was a, you know, the Newtonian laws are a, are, are a thought process in, in that respect. They're a mathematical abstraction, but it then gives us that understanding of, of, of reality that doesn't require any um, empirical testing or proof. So anyway, that's the hardest part and I've just given you top level. So my, my aim with all of this is just to give you a little light touch, high level of some of the bits that I think are unique and that have been rejected um, by um, the uh, econ most economic uh, faculties 
um, you know, around, around the world now, because there's no point in me telling you what you're going to learn in, yeah, Sinan. So what, what um, is commonly understood and accepted in other economic schools of thought is that economics is not based on the axiom that people act purposely, it's based on the subjective idea of that, like a derivation of all these subjective ideas that need to be tested empirically versus Nietzsche, which, who believes that it's an axiom. And then it's all derived from the fact that people act purposely. Is that understanding? Pretty much so, yeah. Okay. That's, that, that, that's pretty, pretty much it. Um, and um, although um, the modern economics uh, uh, departments and faculties, and the one, the one where I did my undergraduates was, was yeah, it's subjective, subjective theory of value, but they, um, you know, they, they all sort of, that's it, and then you move on and then you do lots of em empirical stuff. Um, the value of which, um, some of it, or well, quite a lot of it, I would say, is questionable. Um, but I'm more so. All uh, for for you guys, you know, who are, who are just embarking upon your lives and, and, and careers. All I would say is, you know, I, I like to encourage you to think about that and to think about how valid that is. And it's the real um, muscly part, if you like, the real meaty part of uh, the um, uh, of uh, of uh, the, the disputes between the fact you know what is what is or is not the foundations of, eco of economic thoughts and um, I tend to think if you get your foundations right you you're not going to go that far wrong um, but if your foundations are, are, are shaky then you know most of what you're going to get is going to be shaky thereafter so I, I just encourage you to have a look into that area if you if you're if you're in, inclined you know to do so any other questions before we move on? Now, how do you think the Austrians would ex explain Veblen goods? The idea that as their price goes up, people buy more of them. <coughs> they used to be called Giffen goods uh, in my day, I think. Have they changed? What are they called no, now? No, no, I'm thinking of sort of luxury goods. So yes, Veblen goods. Yes, it's like no. price because of its value. So something like an expensive watch, for example, that people value simply because it's expensive. Yeah, but that's that's not um, that that doesn't defy any any laws of uh, of uh, of, dem of demand and supply. It means that y you value you personally value uh, something. It's the um, that advert Stella Artois is refreshingly expensive. You know, you're not going to believe it unless it's right really expensive. Yeah, <laughs> so you know, so that's not, not that doesn't go anywhere really, does it? It's just your 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 utility functions are completely different. Uh, for that good versus another one. Anything else? Right, well, we will move swiftly on. Um, yeah, the law of association is, look, this is a bit, this is a, a, just a minor one um, in, in, in reality. Um, so, are we all familiar with the, uh, Ricardo's law of comparative advantage? Yeah? No? Okay. Does anyone want to do a quick two minutes on what the law of comparative advantage means for this gentleman? You want? Go on. Sure. So, I, I mean, it's like... I could yeah, yeah, yeah. So, the result is that, say you've got two parties or two countries, and for one, it's more expensive to produce two goods than for another country. Because it's the same They value. still both benefit from oh, yeah. socialising. Yeah, so um, Mises. I'm I'm focusing, by the way, on Mises's unique contributions, not just the not just the Austrian school, um, but he, he one of his unique contributions, I would say, was he he called it the law of association. So he took Ricardo, and then he applied it interpersonally, um, because of course that relationship that you're describing between between nations also ex exists not only it exists between you and I, yeah, it exists between every single hum every single human being. So that law of law of comparative advantage work, works uh, universally. Um, point companies, government agencies, people. So he just he he expanded it out a lot more. And what I don't um, see a lot more. I had a quick look through my uh, one of my eldest son's um, A level economics books, and uh, they just focus on you know law of comparative advantage. I don't know in the university context whether whether it takes it that step further. I've not really, do you, have you ever seen law of comparative advantage applied to individual human beings, interpersonal relations? I, I have a bit in microeconomics. 
in micro. Okay, good. No, I, look, I'm, I'm delighted, but in, when was I, 88 to 91, it certainly wasn't taught to me like that um, when, I was, when I was studying economics. Um, yeah, so that's um, Mises's contribution there. Now, a little bit more of epistemology. So the socialist calculation debate and the limits of knowledge and Hayek and Mises. So does, any, does everyone know who, first of all, does everyone know who Hayek is? So we've got nod, nods and, so we've got both ways. So Friedrich uh, August von Hayek was another Austrian, but he's a German, um, and uh, he um, was a student of Mises in the 20s, in the 1920s and 1930s. He then, Lionel Robbins, then picked him up as one of Mises' greatest students and then brought him to the LSE. And then from the LSE from 1931 to 1950, um, he was a professor there. And it's the works that he did at LSE in the 50s, um, based around a whole series of um, lectures there called Prices and Production, that won him the Nobel Prize in the mid-70s. And that's all on capital theory, which we'll do later. A little, well, I say we'll do it. By the way, each of these things you could spend a lifetime you know, studying, so we're just doing very high level, high level stuff. The, um, yeah, so that's who those, th those two are. So you've got master and you've got student, and student uh, ends up winning, winning the, no the Nobel Prize uh, for his work on capital theory. Um, in the 20s, the socialist calculation debate. Has anyone ever, ever heard about that? Yeah, you have, yeah? So what, tell us, what do you know? Come on. To my knowledge is the, <coughs> is the argument of the Austrians against socialism that when you don't have prices, you can't calculate what is valuable and what, what isn't. Yeah. And therefore, this cannot be used as a signal for what is to be produced and <coughs> how is value to be produced. Yes. So did everyone, did everyone get that? That's a really n lovely, neat, <coughs> neat summary. So basically, me, me, so you're in, um, the, the Russian Revolution has happened. You've got your first Marxist um, state. You've got your first communist state in the, so, in the now Soviet Repu Republic and Soviet Empire, whatever you want to call it. Um, and a lot of Europe uh, what, uh, is thinking about adopting socialism. And in this country here, you've got the Webbs, the Webbs who founded where I was at university, they were one of the founders, the Fabians, um, uh, and, and George Bernard Shaw and all that crew. Uh, they were very pro the Soviet, the Soviet system. Uh, in fact, the, one of them wrote a book, I can't remember which one it was, which web it was, um, about Russian civilization um, and um, uh, um, extolling the virtues of, uh, of communism. They even went to visit there it was the great utopia. This is what they wanted to import into, into here. <coughs> their, later, their later revisions of the book, um, it went on for about 10 years, then put a question mark on the end at least. They did start getting a bit suspect of it. But that was the big debate. And Mises, his great contribution was to show that devoid of the pricing mechanism uh, of, the, of the free market, where you get this allocation of goods, for the reasons that we've talk, talk, spoke about, law of comparative advantage and indeed the law of association, without prices, the pricing mechanism, you would never ever get an efficient allocation of resources and the whole thing would fail. Yeah? Now the socialists, in, in, in fairness to them, uh, they, took that, uh, they took that argument on board um, and in fact the reason why the Soviet Union existed for um, 70 plus years um, is because although it was a command and control economy, they thought, oh, well, we better sort of at least use um, Western market prices as proxies uh, to give us an indi indication of how to allocate resources. Um, so that's how they could continue it for, you know, for mul multiple decades before it, before it collapsed. Uh, as as all, all socialist regimes all, all will collapse, um, it's just a question of, of ha, you know, how, how long, yeah? They all do collapse. There's not one successful social, socialist regime in the world. Um, and that, you see, the, 
the thought process that you could go from there, I mean, I notice you've got free market capitalism and I notice our friend at the back there hates the big state. Yeah. Right, yeah. And uh, you can see why if, if you, if you really, un, if you really think about the socialist calculation debate, then really any, any allocation of resources that not is not done by the market is suboptimal. Um, now, you can say, well, for example, the NHS here, which um, we worship as a, a, as a religion, yeah, <laughs> you know, we must bow down to it, we must clap for it, we must bow down to it, um, we must glorify it, despite the fact that it, um, and don't get me wrong, the workers in it are, not, are good, hard workers, but, you know, it's suboptimal outcomes uh, for, the, for the patients by any stretch of the imagination for every single, every single pound that is committed to it. I think we're on about 28th in the league of health outcomes, yet we're the sixth um, or fifth or sixth, however you look at it, largest uh, economy in the world and spender uh, on these things. And it's because they're running on a, um, on a, on a quasi-socialist type system. So you're going to get suboptimal results. Now, if you know that as an economist, um, then you, you won't be advocating that type of, um, that type of solution. You'll be, ab you'll be advocating other, other more free market orientated um, solutions. But that's not to say, of course, there's the political, um, uh, I suppose, political reality uh, is that some people will say, some people will say well, I'm quite happy to trade that off, have suboptimal, but to have, have uh, you know, greater provision or what, what is perceived to be fairer, uh, fairer um, provision. And that, of course, is a legitimate argument to have. Um, I don't think it gives the proponents of that type of argument the result they want. I still think ultimately it gives a suboptimal, suboptimal argument. A suboptimal optimal provision, sorry, I beg pardon. But um, it's that, that debate, the socialist calculation debate, really sets the scene for every argument you can have about state provision. And he was, he was specifically targeting, you know, Marxist uh, Soviet Union, but it applies to, you know, the most humble thing provided by any local authority or, or um, government, you know, wherever in the world. So it's a very relevant today, but I don't necessarily see it discussed in those terms. That's why I thought I'd mention it. And then his student, Hayek, um, he had a different he had a different take on it or different build on it, which is quite interesting. Is, it, is anyone familiar with that? No? I thought he had the famous essay, The Pretense of Knowledge. Yeah. Where he says only a free market economy can take into account all of the knowledge that is dispersed across so many individuals and any attempt to centralise <coughs> that information would result in the loss of so much of it that you would not have enough information to efficiently coordinate resources. Although it's the use of knowledge in society. Well, there, there, was that, there, were, a number of, there were a number of essays, yeah. But that, that's absolutely right, yeah. So you're familiar with that. Is, it, does, is everybody else familiar with that? Yeah, so, so after, um, after Hayek's work on capital theory and more sort of straightforward economics uh, in, the, in, the, in the 30s to the 50s, he diverted his attention to, to more, although he'd written about this from the 30s, but he really majored on um, writing about how, how the limits of knowledge um, actually, the lim limits of knowledge um, of, of any central planner, uh, for, for, for example, would prevent it from, from, from uh, for, for prevent it or him or whatever institution from fulfilling uh, what, it's, what, it, what it set, set out to do. Um, a bit like how, you know, the price mechanism is the, co is the ul ultimate coordination mechanism. Um, but that's, but the price mechanism is only the ultimate coordination mechanism is everyone is, everyone has got the sort of brains enough to interpret and pick up all these price signals and, and know what to do with these, these price signals, which, is, which of course no one is. And we're in, we're, you know, we're, comp well, we're not useless, but we're not, we're not, we're not that good at that kind of thing because our brains and even the most, you know, whiz bang, fantastic, amazing supercomputer or quantum computer or whatever is never ever going to coordinate the, um, 
zillions and zillions of, uh, of um, decisions and, and that, that 8 billion people are making every single second of every single day, changing all the time, um, which, determ which determine all the prices around the world and how things are allocated. So actually, in fairness to sort of modern uh, contemporary economic, economics uh, departments, they're, they're more okay with that idea um, and that's um, kind of uh, bred whole uh, areas of behavioral, behavioral economics and um, nudge economics and all kind, of all, all kind of things like that. It's sort of spawned off whole, 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 whole different areas. But um, Hayek's, Hayek's uh, point was reinforcing Mises's point, um, you know, very, very subtly, but coming it from a, from a limits of knowledge angle. Um, which is, you know, just brilliant, brilliant thinking. But again, um, you know, it's not. Uh, I don't think it's taught in uh, in your mainstream uh, economics faculties in great places like this and um, uh, Stanford, where you guys are from. Uh, but I think it's worthy of teaching. I think it's worthy of worthy of knowing. Or in, and hopefully you guys can, you know, just start looking into that kind of thing a little bit more. Um, any more questions or anything? Can we move on? <laughs> so, theory of money, regression theorem. Does anyone know anything about that? Oh, you do again. Yeah, you're the, you're the Mises guy, right? Yeah, you know. Go on. Well, the, the value of money is determined by the value of money that was yesterday, which in turn is determined by the value of money that is the day before. So there has to come a point where um, money has a value that isn't because everybody believes it has a value, but because it has a value for its use. And Mises believes you can trace that back to gold because that had its had a use value. And then it adopted these um, monetary values which people thought, well, I'll, I'll value that because it's valuable to in exchange, but it originally had a use value. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, I'd, I'd agree with that, except I'd say I don't... He, um, he mentions gold, but he also mentions other other things, commodities that were that were um, exchanged uh, a, a, as well. But the, the central the reason the, the problem came about because you know nobody could determine um, why money ha had value. Um, I mean, a load of people just think, oh well, the, the, it's got the queen now now it will have the king's head on it. It has value because the state says says so. Yeah. It's like, you know, it will be this value, yeah? Um, but no, um, and Mises uh, said, well, actually, if you, for him, if you think about it, um, I, I believe this money has value because it's exchanged for something today. And, and I believe that I, for exactly the reasons that you said, and, I, and because I did that yesterday, that's why I believe it has value. And you go down through the chain of, transactions and you always root yourself back into some kind of commodity and before and before that actually debt it was um the oldest uh things that we could associate with money are actually debit or, or credit transactions so back in um mesopotamia you know three four thousand years ago you have these tablets that record you know um I'm not, i don't know their names but you just say billy sold five you know not sold uh you transacted five flasks of wine for six bags of grain and there's a period of time separation because they've got to be delivered and taken over and then ultimately uh, paid for in that type of barter of goods against goods and then you see then you so commodities effectively and then you see the most marketable of all the commodities emerging um, at some at some point in time um, which tends to be either gold or silver, um, but it's only it's only it's only that it's those, those they're chosen because they have all the characteristics that um, determine what a money is, which is the, the it's the mo most um, exchangeable uh, thing. It's uh, the, there's there's no good that it, it that it can't be presented to that it won't exchange for, yeah. So it's highly exchangeable, and it's that because it, it and and from there spins off the, the things that store value. Um, 
I've forgotten all the things, um, e um, easily sort of transportable and, you know, all the things that make uh, what we understand m money to be. But it's basically because it's the, the final thing for which all goods can exchange. And it derives its value ultimately from prior transactions and they're all, they're all rooted in commodities. So, interestingly, you know, we've seen in my lifetime the invention of the euro. Yeah, that's just come out of nowhere. Um, now, does that refute that way of thinking? Or does that support that way of thinking? Well, the only reason the euro has been used because it was tied to the previous... Yeah, the Do Deutsche Mark, the Franc, the um, Lira, um, you know, all of those currencies, yeah, who all had their prior value from some kind of commodity. Yeah, and back and back and back and back and back. Uh, what about Bitcoin? What do you think there? It's the same way. The thing about fiat is that it's, to, to my knowledge or to my understanding, it, it couldn't possibly fully be in that system because uh, it's no longer a free exchange. We are no longer free to choose whether we'll deal in pound sterling or gold coin. So it, I believe that if we have the choice to deal in gold coin, we might. Some people might choose to do it. Yeah. So, but people in the UK can't do that. People in the EU's own can choose not to use euro. Well, actually, I mean, sovereigns are legal here, legal tender. Well, that's, yeah. I don't know that's good. I don't think that's the case in the EU. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've no idea. But, the, but it's not actually. So but the, po the point is that, those, that the, the euro only has value because of what James said, because the, all those basket of currencies that it was converted from had prior value going all the way back down the chain to various, various commodities. So although it's fiat, it's by command, it's still rooted in, it's still rooted in value. But the one, I'm, the one I'm trying to tease out is, bit, is Bitcoin, because that's, not, that's been created out of nowhere. Yeah? It's computer code. So where do you think that where do you think that fits? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, is most sorry. So is most fiat money. The majority of fiat money is digital. Yeah. It is literally created out of nothing. And the difference between fiat and Bitcoin is that there is no hard cap, and there is no price production. Yeah. So. To create Bitcoin, one has to invest a lot of energy to create dollars. Yeah, you do have that. First of all, everyone can mine Bitcoin, theoretically speaking. Yeah. Everyone can print. That, that's right. That, they're, they're, the, they're differences, but they're not. So but the fiat still rests on, on this chain. The Bitcoin, does it rest on that chain of. No. No. Yeah. I don't it, think it disproves it. So if you're it, question there. You think it disproves it? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. So here's a question then. If if I if I if I give you a little bit of Bitcoin, yeah. sorry, have you, you got a question? No, no, sorry. Yeah. If I've got it, can you go and buy a pint of milk at Tesco with Bitcoin? No. So is You're it, say it's not money, is it is it the final goods yeah. Is it the final goods for which all things can exchange? No, not yet. And the reason why I say it not yet, because it might be. Hmm. I mean it might it might be in the in, in the due course of time. But at the moment, most people, although some people can exchange Bitcoin for things without it being mediated into a fiat currency or, or, or some commodity. I mean, there are some places, I think um, Ecuador, you can, you, know, you can do Bitcoin transactions without it being interme intermediated through, through something else. Um, so it might, it might emerge into money, but then, then it will then start picking up its own prior history uh, uh, trade anywhere root, rooted into rooted into what those fiats were worth when it was converting into something something equivalent. But the original Bitcoin didn't have no, no. use value in the way no. that gold or clam shells no. did. It, it had a value because a bunch of libertarians thought, let's see if we can create currency. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll they had the characteristics of gold, limited supply. Yeah. Can't can't be um, you know monopolized by anybody and so, that would yeah. be, so if it does become widely accepted, that would be an example against the regression theory. 
but until such a time or if such a time. Well, well I'm saying, I'm saying it, it could appear to be, but I'm saying I don't necessarily think it does because the only reason why said Tesco is, ex, it would exchange it yeah, is because the day before um, it, it exchanged, for, it exchanged for, for some fiat equivalent. Uh, for that, for that price, that 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 thing was at, was given equivalent value for them to accept that as uh, as an equivalent value. It's accepted the the equivalent value of the fiat by 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 implication. So does it, or I'm not so I'm not so sure. Um, so then the chain goes back through fiat. Yeah, I'm saying the chain then then goes back through fiat and, and all the way back. So I don't know. I, yeah, I have to think about that. Yeah, I, look. I, I'm not settled on that, by the way, at all. I'm, I'm, it's only been in existence for, I don't know, 12 years or something. I'm still thinking about it. Um, but um, that's interesting to watch that because it could, it could refute that. I don't think it will for the reasons why you've got to have at some point there's parity in the minds of these major adopters um, who are only taking on that adoption because they know it can deliver what fiat they've delivered, a fiat exchange. But I don't know. I, I don't know. Sorry, who's asking? You were... Oh, someone was at the back, no? All right. Did you get that thing I sent from... So, yeah, so look, here's another... So on money, again, so is that discussed in, in economics courses, undergraduate economics courses, the great regression theorem at all? No, okay. So it's worthwhile discussing that, I think. So this guy here is a friend of mine, um, Dr. Frank Shostak. Um, yeah, I can't remember what he calls himself now, a AAS Economics, um, Applied Austrian School e Economics. And um, what's really interesting here is he has his definition, well, his definition of money supply and my definition, I've, I've written on this as, uh, as well, is because money we've established is the final thing for which all goods exchange, yeah, the definition of money uh, that you use um, and in my, back in my day when I used to look at these things, M1, M2, the M's, M1, M2, M3, M4. And I think it's been consolidated down nowadays to M2 and M4. And they were, M0 was just, no, was just no, notes and coins. Um, but the key thing is, and again, I've lost touch with this, but because um, I don't bother, uh, I don't bother modeling these things any, any, anymore. But when I used to, in, in all those, uh, indexes, the M, M2, 3, and 4, they had things that uh, you couldn't pass the Tesco test. That's what I'm going to call it, yeah? So if you go, if you go in, uh, in with a certificate of deposit and say, oh, um, can I have a pint of milk? Uh, Tesco will say, no, you need to change it into money, funnily enough, yeah? Oh, but what about my savings, what about my savings account um, that's on a time deposit? But it's millions, yeah? No, no, no. You uh, can you give me some money, please? Yeah, and that's either a bank transfer from a demand deposit, uh, a check, which is from your bank account, which is a demand deposit, uh, or or notes and coins. Yeah, that that's the only thing that functions as money um, in um, in in this country and in all certainly in all in all Western in all Western countries. But the indexes that measure measure things that are near money they have moneyness yeah but re but really often they're as i said things like savings you may save in a 90-day savings account but that's gone off and been invested somewhere so for you to call that whatever it's been invested in has to be sold to then credit you for you to then go and buy your buy your goods and services so it's not money until it's done that process yeah so strict definition of money supply i think is useful I can probably show you show you where if you want to toggle down to some of the graphs. Um, yeah, this, this is interesting. So, um, leading index is Frank's. Um, I'll call it a, a Austrian money supply, which is that very very tight definition. And look how it's. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Look how it's. Uh, that's a pretty good correlation with uh, the purchasing manufacturers index. Yeah. And you can see, look, the financial crisis, the then reflation of the economy, then kind of it, you know, doing ups and downs and then back into COVID, 
reflating, massive reflation, then, then we're in the deflation period now, a real deflation of, of, of money, i.e. a contraction of, of the growth of the, money, of the money supply. We should have a few more. There's a, we can go down in a few more. Oh yeah, so what was that? The, um, I looked at this this morning, that's meant to say, because it's all about the UK, this whole thing. It's, right, well don't worry, it's mislabeled USA. <laughs> but anyway, um, delinquency rates of business loans. What does that mean? Hmm? What, what is the delinquency rate of business loans? Uh, people f uh, failing to perform on their loans, going bust, okay. things like that. Um, private sector credit, great correlation with the money supply. I mean, mon monetarists, by the way, if they were using this, uh, they'd be the uh, they'd be the main. They, they would be the school of thought that would be dominating um, the nation now, because uh, because they were using all those other measures. Because remember the claim the claim of the monetarists was that if you if you um, can um, uh, telegraph the rates of um, uh, money supply and how they're going to increase or decrease out to the economy, people will adjust accordingly. Yeah, and you can keep things in fairly fairly much equilibrium. Nice happy Goldilocks uh, state of the economy. Um, now, I mean, you might be able to do it if you had a more tight and a proper definition. So let's see a few more. That's against GDP, isn't it? Um, so you can see, you can see again, is that GDP? No, or housing. Yeah, again, well, that's against housing, mortgages. But you get the idea. It's a very, it's just a good correlation. And it all, stem, it all stems back to do you have a good definition? You know, are you logically robust on what you actually define as money? You know, because surprisingly, a lot of economists, I let you please go back to your economics departments and ask them to define money. Yeah, they'll give you the nice little thing. Oh, it's the final thing for which all, all goods exchange uh, and it's a store of value and it's uh, potable, and portable and it's this, that and the other and then they'll tell you about the money supply measures. And then if you interrogate them on the money supply measures, you know, actually challenge them, well, does, does that fit that original definition that you said? Yeah? And I think the answer is no, yeah? That's why I think it's worthwhile um, thinking about it through, through an Austrian lens. You know, I think we've... Any questions on that? How are we doing for time? Well, blimey, we're a bit over, right? Um, do a few more. We'll, well, look, maybe 10 or 15 minutes more, should we do? Yeah. OK, thank you. Right, so capital theory. So I mentioned that Hayek uh, was at the London School of Economics uh, for the 31 to 50, and he did some real thinking on capital theory. Um, so his thinking is diametrically opposite to what is the perceived wisdom uh, of today. So when we talk about capital, does, it, does there, everyone know, any, does anyone know anything about capital theory? Has anyone ever studied capital theory? Take here. Come on, you guys in the economics department. No, okay. So are, are you told capi, a capital is homogeneous? Is it, given a, is it given a K? Yeah, just that's it, yeah? It's just all, all the same. So this chair's, this chair's the same as that iPhone is the same as that light, yeah? In some models it's like different forms of capital go with different forms of labor. Yeah. In that way, it's yeah, not more than two different types of capital. Yeah, okay. Well, so <clears throat> these guys, the Austrians, have a much richer um, theory of capital and it's very much heterogeneous, you know? Uh, it's not definitely not homogeneous. When you, when you get it into a homogeneous state, it just becomes something that you can manipulate in mathematical formulas that can and that can uh, disguise a, a whole load of, a whole load of things and um, the other the other uh, before we come to what the Austrian uh, Austrian thing is um, the other thing in capital uh, the other thing by looking through that lens of uh, uh, of thinking capital is is ho homogeneous um, there's and and looking through capital modern capital theory you're told that um, consumption is 70% uh, of the economy and that stimulating demand is the way to grow the economy. That's the convention, that's, that's the wife. 
attitude. <laughs> it's hard to tell her I'm so <laughs> sorry, my love. I'm 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 uh, speaking to some Oxford students tonight. Can I call you back later? Oh, she can't hear me anyway. I better turn that off. Uh, sorry, I didn't put that on um, on on um, silent. Um, yeah, so com conventionally, in, in, in macro and in capital theory, uh, you'll be told e economy is 70% consumption. Um, demand is the thing that uh, is, if we're going into a depression, that's when we're falling. If we're, you know, if we're booming, that's when demand is really pulling, pulling us uh, all, all, all up and happy days, yeah? That's what we're told, yeah? Now, I'm going to tell you that my opinion, I think that's all very wrong, yeah? So... What someone like um, someone like Mises Mies actually started it in his book um, Theory of Money and Credit in, 20, in 1912. Hayek then built Hayek then built on it, and what they what they said is they said cap, they distinguish capital on a timeline uh, for a start. So when you're told it's K, there's no no such conception really of time in there, is there in the mix? Yeah. So they put capital on a timeline, and then they had. Uh, the 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 um the nearest um the nearest to consumption yeah that is the latest stages of production the furthest away from consumption yeah uh, is the is the um is the uh the head of the, the 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 start of the production process yeah and is the furthest away and the shortest so for example something like um let's have a look at this something like this 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 hand gel yeah so as a, fine, as a final good, um, that's counted in, in GDP statistics, as we know. But the factory that made, made this plastic will not be, because it's an inter intermediate stage of production. Yeah? Neither will the stuff that's inside. And the factory that made the stuff, whatever this is, alcohol, lots of chemical things I can't pronounce, you know, that's all been made somewhere down a huge, great, big, long chain of production furthest away from the consumer um, and that's a that's a multi-staged uh, production process it doesn't appear in any of the um, GDP accounts um, and you only see the, f the final bit or the consumption stage of it um, so you, so we're looking at it um, in my opinion and in the Austrians opinion from the wrong wrong lens because you're 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 missing out what goes on down that down that uh, down that capital structure because at each stage of that capital structure, the process is more and more complex, more and more roundabout, they called it, more deeper, more money spent, more complex. You, you think of the machinery, the kit, um, the massive factories that are taken to make this, this one small tiny product that you're, gonna, you're going to consume. And I don't know what this costs, let's say it costs a five pounds or something. And then you think about you know, the sheer amount of capital that is committed, getting bigger and bigger and bigger in higher quantums all the way you go down the, down the chain of uh, production, yeah? All the, way, all, the way all, all the way down there. And that's all excluded because we think it's double counting, yeah? In the GDP accounts, it's all, it, all of that is offset because they say, well, the entirety of the price of all of that is reflected in this, yeah? Which is true in one respect, but it means that two thirds of the economy doesn't exist uh, in terms of any, any national accounting or any economics, any economic accounting at all. Um, and when you look at the United States now does produce what's called um, gross, uh, gross product output. Um, so you can, go to the, you can go to the Federal Reserve figures and you can now, you can now look at the two thirds of the economy. So when you go back to Stanford, you can say, I want to look at the two thirds of the economy that I don't see. So if the American economy, uh, I'm just going to use round, a round number, is 30 trillion in size, you've probably got actually a hundred trillion economy there, you know? And so, so that uh, lengthy and roundabout um, set of uh, capital setup that we have um, is predicated upon capital, which is predicated upon your savings. Yeah. So, the the 
the other thing that everyone completely ignores, yeah, because we're all told consumption, 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 demand, 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 spend, 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 yeah. But how does uh, this guy, Mr. Relizan, how does how does he get his money in his factory set up? Yeah, he gets that set up um, because he's he's must have refrained from from consumption at some point in time, or he must have borrowed a stack load of money uh, from from banks who are representing lots of little people who've saved at, so, at some point in time, and you have their their resources and 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 their money. So it's savings is the key to the elongation, the deepening, the widening of that capital structure. Yeah, and how many people talk about savings and thrift? Yeah, does any, anyone ever hear that in an economics department? Unless it's negative, yeah? Um, so, and here's, here's the great divide, you know? It's not, not just as big a divide, it's, it's like a divide between a believer and an atheist, yeah? That's how, that's how absolutely opposite it is, because uh, a Hayekian or Miesian or Austrian would say the absolute core to growing an economy yeah, is that capital structure and saving the savings that provide, well, obviously you've got to have ideas, the entrepreneurs have got to have, we'll come on to the entrepreneurs in a minute, but the entrepreneurs have to have the ideas to move those factors into production or create new ways of combining those factors of production to make better goods, services, and products, yeah? But they only do that with your savings, our savings, yeah? You can't do it, and so, so if, you, if you create money out of nowhere, yeah, there's been, there, there's been no prior act of production and no prior act of savings. So you're exchanging something, sorry, you're exchanging nothing, i.e., you know, a, a, a minted up, uh, number in a, in, a, in a computer in a bank uh, department and you're exchanging it for real products and real goods and services. That doesn't lengthen the structure of production, yeah? That's a, that's a something, so it's a nothing for something, yeah? So that's, that's actually you, you, you going backwards, you're eating into the cupboard. You know, it's like, you know, looking at your kitchen cupboard and your money printing is just in, an instantaneous satisfaction of eating the can of baked beans, yeah? There with no consequences whatsoever. Whereas someone's got, that will never be replaced unless, unless you've refrained from some consumption, some prior consumption in savings to, to, to build and develop out that capital structure. So I take that view, um, and I, so I'm standing diametrically opposite to the uh, mainstream view of how the, economy, how the economy works and how it propels itself, how it propels itself forward. And um, that's a bit that's been pretty much rejected um, from uh, the, main, the mainstream of economics um, for, you know, reasons uh, which I'm not, you know, entirely, entire, well, I'm not convinced by, that's why I don't believe, that's why I don't believe them. Um, but um, when, you, when, you, when, you do, when you do your nice little mathematical equation with a, with a, with a capital in it, you can see it's, not, it's nice and easy, just, you know, boost, uh, you know, boost the, boost the expenditures, uh, capital goes up, boom, more things, more things come out. But you know, it's it's, it's not that simple, yeah. Um, and and it's all driven, it's all driven by savings anyway. In, in proportion to the creation of money since um, since the Fed was formed in whenever it was, 1913, um, and now, where you know all of the uh, short-sighted politicians jumped on. Bandwagon saying, oh, yes, let's let's inflate until government debt is reduced. Yeah, I mean it is. It, it's it's completely emperor's clothes. Yes, correct. I think at, at some point in time it will uh, it will all fall apart. But at some point in time it could be a very long point in time. Yeah, uh, it could be could be tomorrow. It, it could be tomorrow. It could be they, regime change. By the way, monetary regime change. I think I, I read something. Uh, it's roughly every every 40, 40 to seventy years. Is it, if you think about it, it was um, the Portuguese uh, had the global currency. Um, then it was the Spanish, and then they, you know, 
actually you can go back all the way to the Romans, you can probably go back all the way to the Mesopotamians, but at key points in history, so in recent history, Portuguese around the 1500s and the Spanish probably up to about the 1800s. Um, then it's, you know, it's the British Empire and the pound. Um, then it's, uh, then it, and we're now with dollar, um, and all of these later ones were underpinned by the gold standard. They have a longer, longer longevity. Uh, and then the re last regime, then it was Bretton Woods after the Second World War, and then it was um, 1971 with uh, Nixon coming off the gold, which um, although is not a default, it's a default by anyone's understanding because we've all been impoverished in terms of what the value of the dollar is in our pocket uh, since. Um, as we ha always have when we come off these re regime changes. And these regime changes are largely driven about by mass warfare. Um, in fact, I think warfare is the most common thing. P uh, uh, empires overextending themselves uh, hi his historically because they've forgotten about, well, actually, you need to be doing some work productively, saving, building things, you know, refraining from consumption, refraining from being profligate. So I think, you know, are we being profligate, USA and us? Well, probably, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So. I mean, a child can see it. I mean, you know, yeah. you can literally look at it at a child's level. Yeah. The child is wearing a suit. He doesn't speak with a posh accent. He's dressed in his straw hat. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And yet a child can see it. Yeah. Uh, as you say, it's difficult to predict, but I think it's pretty imminent. Yeah. And, and, when they, and they're going to carry on with the digital currencies, which are more of the same, because they are not tied to services. Yeah. Or, or any natural material. Yeah. So they are just a con built upon the existing ones. You, you mean uh, state controlled or state endorsed digital currencies? Oh, state, yeah. State yeah. This is what, yeah. you know, which, what they're working at collectively yeah. and Davos and all this shit. Yeah. I mean, they need, they need, they need to be lined up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't comment on that last point, but the other points, yeah, I, I, I agree with. But, um, anyway, so you can see that's a, I think a, 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 when you go back to your uh, economics departments or whatever departments you're in, that is another thing I'd encourage you to think about is about capital theory and getting into, getting into it and understanding it because I think that will help you in life, you know, as you navigate through, through life, whatever you choose to do. Just really understanding how, how the economy works, um, I think it, it, it is helpful and it's rejected uh, from, from, from mainstream. Um, Austrian theory of the business cycle and entrepreneurship. So we'll just do a quick, we'll do a quick uh, little run over of those. So as you can see with capital theory, how it then tags into business cycle theory um, is, if, is if you're doing the easy fix, um, which is, oh blimey, we've spent too much, we're in trouble, um, just mint up a bit more money. Um, whether you call it printing or whether you call it digitally you know, creating, um, journal entries in, 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 in computers, whatever. It's all, it's all creating more um, purchasing power out of nowhere, yeah? What you do is, you, uh, at this end of uh, the consumption end, yeah, we buy more of these, yeah, because they're cheaper, yeah, we have, we're, we're being charged less, um, uh, there's, we have more in our bank accounts because the interest rates are lower, yeah, we've got more expenditure, we, 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 we spend. Happy days, yeah? These guys are happy. They place more orders down the production. They place more orders to the guys who produce the bottles, place more orders with the guys who produce the fluid in there, whatever's in there. Happy days, we're booming, yeah? Superb, great. These guys down here think, whoopee doo, um, this is looking good, and we're gonna make some more investments. Um, but blimey, if I'm gonna make um, enough to satisfy 10% more of these. I've got to extend my factory by X percent and it's going to cost millions and millions and millions and millions, yeah? So they then go out and borrow, yeah? Off the banks. Um, if it's from prior saving, good news. If it's from newly freshly minted money, um, then that's going to be a, a, something that will distort the process because no, no prior production has taken, taken place and no, and no refraining from consumption. Um, so they get this money and they bid up um, the prices and resources of all the various uh, components and factors of production that they need um, down the supply chain. And uh, whilst, they're do whilst they're doing that, bidding up those prices there, things are getting more expensive uh, now 
for the end consumer down there. And lo and behold, we get a bit of inflation, yeah, um, which, we, which we're seeing now. And then down here, all the people down here, they're, oh, blimey, I need more wages, yeah? Um, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna ca uh, carry on buying these things and so on and so forth, and I rather like buying these things, I've adjusted to it. This is now my lifestyle, this is what I consider normal, yeah? I wanna buy more, yeah? Why shouldn't I buy more? It's my right to buy more, yeah? And they then start bidding up prices, yeah? And so, down, and, and so at some point in time, yeah, there's just simply not enough money to, fill, to fulfill all the desires uh, and all the needs. And these poor guys down here who've then, then spent money and time building factories, because they're further, they're further away from the thing, and it's more expensive, it's deeper, longer production processes, um, they're left often carrying the can, they go bust, or some of them go bust, yeah? And then we're into a correction uh, side of the economy. Now that's, you know, a two minute little potted history of the Austrian theory of the business cycle, but how it, how it um, relates to capital theory, yeah? Um, that's where it all comes from. Uh, that's rejected by the, um, by the mainstream. As I said, the, the, main, the mainstream, if you call it Keynesians will say, no, 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 that's all wrong. It's because people are just demanding less. Yeah. Therefore, we've got to stimulate some activities and repeat the whole process all over again. The problem with that is every time you repeat the whole process, the, pro the, the collapse just gets, it just gets bigger, the, the magnifications of the extremes of the, uh, uh, of the outcomes. And the monetarists will say, oh, no, 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 no. It's because, um, you know, money, you remember I showed you those diagrams there where we're going through a contraction now, a real contraction of, of, of money disappearing. Although we, we're seeing the inflation now, but with time lag, you, we will absolutely see ourselves going into, you know, a, a, a prices falling down quite, quite considerably in the, ne in the ne next nine months. They'll say, oh, well, you just need to put more money in there, fill in the gaps, you know, uh, fill, in, fill, in the, fill in the troughs, even it out so it's not peaks and troughs. So they come at it from a slightly different angle. And you know, there are more, there are more theories, uh, and there are, there, but, but this one is rejected by, by everybody. <laughs> now, I don't, I, I, all my experience of working in the economy and building businesses and being involved in that structure of production, uh, that's as I see it. Uh, I see it logically as a pure theory of capital and I see it by my own participation in the economy. So again, I'd encourage you to, to look at the Austrian theory of the business cycle and take it seriously. Then finally, um, is anyone, anyone investor or likes to invest? You're probably not sort of at that stage yet, yeah? But in your life, you might become, you, you will hopefully get capital, um, surplus to your, to, to your needs and your requirements, and you become an investor. I mean, you, you, by the fact that you will have a, have a job and you'll be paying into a, a pension, you are investors, yeah? Your investors admittedly removed from the action, but your, your pension is being invested uh, in all these, uh, in, in uh, all, all various different parts of the economy, um, you know, from and various different financial inst instruments to factories to you name it and everything in between. Yeah, so, so you, you should be aware of this, but because it does affect you, even if you, even if you never become an investor, uh, investor in the sense that I am, where, you know, I, I, I select where I allocate my capital. So someone is doing that on your behalf, yeah, uh, if, you're not doing it for your, if you're not doing it for yourself is that um, you'll probably be a little bit more of a cautious investor. Now that's good and that's bad, yeah? It's good in terms of, it's the more tortoise approach, but the tortoise can win against the hare. But it, because you're more cautious, those upswings and those where the boom is happening, you're more than likely to view that as the error-making process. So, you know, when you when you see that boom happening, there's nothing wrong in participating in that boom, uh, but as long as you're, all, it's a bit like musical chairs. You've got to think, well, oh, well, when I'm going around the table and there's, you know, there's six of us going around the table, there's only five chairs. I really ought to think about which one I'm going to be sitting down on, yeah. But timing is invariably impossible, so you've got to be really, really careful if you're going to participate in the boom uh, environment. So, because you know it's going to go bust, and. The most famous words you'll ever hear is this time it's different, yeah? It never is. <laughs> in short, it never is. It always ends in bust. The story is the same. It's a bit like the Titanic. 
you know when you're going to watch it, it ends in disaster, the ship sinks, yeah? Um, it's exactly the same, same with the, 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 the boom, and, boom and bust uh, cycle, you know where it's going to end. So I think if, you're, if you um, have that kind of background and that frame of mind of understanding through the Austrian lens, you may not be the, 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 the fastest and the best performer in your, in your, in your investment uh, career, but you'll survive where a lot of people won't and you'll prosper. So I think in the long term, you'll do better. Um, oh, we never did entrepreneurship, did we? But entrepreneurship, right, okay, so the entrepreneurship, yeah. So remember that original axiom. So the original axiom, people act, they act purposefully um, and they rank their um, preferences uh, according to things they want to do in the, in the immediate now, to the near future, to the furthest future. So that's how we get the demand, demand side. Now, as, a, as an entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur myself, I spend my time thinking about, well, you know, what do people really need and what do they really want? Yeah. How, and how alert am I to ascertaining those needs and wants and, and requirements? And the, the role of the entrepreneur is to then go and find solutions to those uh, most sort of knotty uh, needs and requirements and, 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 uh, and problems and do them better, cheaper, faster, quicker, you name it, whatever positive adjective you can put to it. Yeah, That's what we're in the business as entrepreneurs of, of doing, is trying to make your life easier. Yeah, Trying to solve things that you, you want solved and our success is driven uh, in a free market by that. Um, and that's the role of entrepreneurship. And I don't think it's ever discussed enough, really. I see in university departments where they talk about entrepreneurship, they, they sort of do business case uh, studies of, uh, you know, an entrepreneur does X, Y, or Z and does this, that, and the other. But I don't think they really think, really discuss enough, and the Austrians certainly do, about what the actual role of the, uh, of the entrepreneur, what is the, what is the uh, the foundations of the entrepreneurial thought process and what are they trying to trying to do and when you think of it like that you realize that the entrepreneur is the change agent in in all of uh, in all of society he she uh, or whatever they create uh, is the thing that moves the factors of production um, in in better formats uh, and better ways to create to create those new goods and services you know, at some point in time, there was a guy who was walking along the ground and, you know, steps on black, horrible stuff that's sticky and, 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 and everyone hates that stuff and then suddenly thinks of a use for it, you know, because it can burn and it becomes oil and it becomes fossil fuels and it becomes the foundation of the Industrial Revolution, yeah? That's what entrepreneurs do and that's what, that's what their role is, because is, is, all the factors of production exist there, They're all, they all exist, yeah? It's just up for us to discover and find them and, and then match them to sorting out uh, better uh, things uh, for us. So, again, I don't find entrepreneurship is really taken that seriously. I may be wrong uh, in, in any of the ec economics uh, faculties, but um, without putting the entrepreneur at the absolute centre of uh, any discussion of economics, um, then you're just doing abstract stuff, you know, abstract academic stuff, which I don't think is going to tell you actually what's, what's really going on in the economy. So that is why um, I wanted to just give you a little touch on, on entrepreneurship through the Austrian lens. But otherwise, young man, um, I think we're done. Unless, questions? Thank you very much. No. <laughs> uh, pleasure.